So welcome everyone to day two of the Oklahoma SHPO's tax incentives uh, workshops. Um, I'm glad you're all here. Uh, my name is Sarah Warnke and I am the Historic Preservation Tax Incentives Program Coordinator here at the Oklahoma SHPO, as well as the Historic Preservation Architect. This session will be recorded and we'll be taking questions at the end of the presentation. So please put them in the Q&A portion in the upper right hand corner of the webinar. Um, if you need continuing education certification, um, you know, credits, uh, please follow the sticky that's in the chat. Um, and that way we can get those to you at the end of the day. So with that, I will go ahead and turn off my camera. That way I can save some bandwidth. All right. All right. So today we're going to talk about the Secretary of the Interior's standards for the rehabilitation of historic properties. The Secretary of the Interior standards for rehabilitation are the central document of historic preservation philosophy and practice in the United States. The standards were first drafted in 1975 by the National Park Service's Technical Preservation Services Unit. They were devised at the request of the Department of Housing and Urban Development for the use in a historic preservation loan program administered by HUD and also for the use in the Historic Preservation Fund Grants Program administered at the time by the National Park Service. In the years since, they have become known throughout the country and are used by federal and state agencies, by local governments, and by thousands of historic district commissions throughout the country. In one form or another, they are used by virtually everybody who works on historic properties in this country. The standards are general principles that govern the work on a historic resource. The standards for rehabilitation are codified in federal regulation and are used in the federal and state tax incentives programs to determine whether projects are consistent with the historic character of the building undergoing rehabilitation. So the standards. The Secretary of the Interior standards for the treatment of historic properties are common sense historic preservation principles in non-technical language. They promote historic preservation best practices that will help to protect our nation's irreplaceable cultural resources. The standards offer four distinct approaches to the treatment of historic properties, preservation, rehabilitation, restoration, and reconstruction with accompanying guidelines for each. One set of standards will apply to a property undergoing treatment, depending upon the property's significance, existing physical condition, the extent of the documentation available, and interpretive goals when applicable. The standards are a series of concepts about maintaining, repairing, and replacing historic materials, as well as designing new additions or making alterations. The guidelines offer general design and technical recommendations to assist in applying the standards to a specific property. Together, they provide a framework for guidance for decision-making about work or changes to a historic property. The standards and guidelines can be applied to historic properties of all types, materials, construction, sizes, and use. They both include interior and the exterior, and extend to a property's landscape features, site, environment, as well as related new construction.
Federal agencies use the standards and guidelines in carrying out their historic preservation responsibilities. State and local officials use them in reviewing both federal and non-federal rehabilitation proposals. This includes Section 106 projects. Historic district and planning commissions across the country use the standards and guidelines to guide their design review processes. The standards for the treatment of historic properties codified in 36 CFR 68 are regulatory for all grants and aid projects assisted through the National Historic Preservation Fund. The standards for rehabilitation, as codified in 36 CFR 67, are regulatory for the review of rehabilitation work in the Historic Preservation Tax Incentives Program. The guidelines are advisory, not regulatory. The following standards for rehabilitation are the criteria used to determine if a rehabilitation project qualifies as a certified rehabilitation. The intent of the standards is to assist the long-term preservation of a property's significance through the preservation of historic materials and features. The standards pertain to historic buildings of all materials, construction types, sizes, and occupancy, and encompass the exterior and the interior of buildings. The standards also encompass related landscape features and the building's site and environment, as well as attached, adjacent, or related new construction. To be certified, a rehabilitation project must be determined by the secretary to be consistent with the historic character of the structures and where applicable the district in which it is located. The following standards are to be applied to specific rehabilitation projects in a reasonable manner, taking into consideration economic and technical feasibility. As I said, they apply to the exterior and to the interior of historic buildings. They apply to properties of all materials, types, sizes, uses, architectural styles, and periods. They apply to buildings and their landscapes, sites, environments, and attached, adjacent, or related new construction. Standard number one. A property shall be used for its historic purpose or be placed in a new use that requires minimal change to the defining characteristics of the building and its site and environment. This could also be like be a like for like use, such as a historic department store being converted into another retail space. Or it could be a similar use, like a historic hotel being rehabilitated into apartments. What isn't appropriate would be like a church sanctuary or gymnasium being converted into apartments due to the inherent necessity to subdivide the historically large open volume. This could also be boiled down to just a compatible new use. These are the Sunset Vogue Blue Ribbon Apartments Historic District in Lawton. Before and after is the same use, no change at all. This, by definition, is a compatible new use. This is the Will Rogers Hotel in Claremore. This historic hotel 
was rehabilitated into low-income housing. This use is compatible because it allows the building to maintain its historic public spaces while allowing the historic hotel rooms to be reconfigured into apartments. This one's a little unusual, but it's the Calvary Baptist Church in Oklahoma City. This is a unique one, but we managed to pull it off. Historically, this was a church and it was rehabilitated into law offices. Through the careful use of um, glass wall partitions, we're able to subdivide the space while still maintaining the open air volume that was historically significant to this space. So the Citizens Bank, the Citizen State Bank or more commonly known as the Gold Dome. And sometimes there are some properties that are more difficult than others to find a compatible new use for. This could be based on a variety of reasons, but in the case of the Gold Dome, it is because the interior space is almost as significant as the exterior, and it was designed in a particular way that is difficult to rehabilitate into anything other than a bank or other open commercial space with adjoining offices. One day, hopefully soon, a new developer will purchase the building and be able to install new programming that is compatible with its unique architecture. Standard number two, the historic character of a property shall be retained and preserved. The removal of historic materials or alterations of features and spaces that characterize a property shall be avo avoided or historic character. These are what we call character defining features and are often indicative of the building's architectural style. The historic character of this row house underwent immense damage when the two-story bay was removed from the facade. And a new incompatible three-story bay was added. This of course does not meet standard two. Likewise, this 1929 warehouse underwent a change in its historic industrial character when it was rehabilitated for residential apartments. The inclusion of all those openings for the windows is not compatible with the industrial use. It changes the overall character of that monolithic wall and is therefore does not meet standard two. This 19th century carriage house retained the large opening for vehicular access, although the opening was modified in recent decades. During the rehabilitation, the opening was filled in with residential scale windows. It is now very difficult to tell exactly what the building was. This is the Clayton Wells building in Sepulpa. This building is one of the largest buildings in downtown Sepulpa. In the 1960s, the building's street-facing elevations were covered in decorative metal paneling. At the time that the nomination for the historic district was written, the building was listed as a non-contributing resource due to these metal panels.
Through the course of the tax credit project, it was discovered that the original elevations were more or less intact behind the screens. The metal screens were removed and, in doing so, restored the building's historic integrity. The rehabilitation was completed and certified in 2018. Standard number three. Each property shall be recognized as a physical record of its time, place, and use. Changes that create a false sense of historical development, such as adding conjectural features or architectural elements from other buildings, shall not be undertaken, or historic period. You don't want to fake history. Each building is unique and is therefore assessed against itself and how it communicates its story. Here is an example of the good twin evil twin. One half of this Victorian double house was earlyed up with faux colonial features while the other retains its mid-19th century appearance and character. This, of course, does not meet standard number three. The insertion of a modern, incompatible, core clad house into a historic residential neighborhood distracts from the historic period of this residential historic district. Standard number four, most properties change over time. Those changes that have acquired historic significance in their own right shall be retained and preserved. This is also referred to as acquired significance. This is a very recent, um, interpretation of this. This is the Cowman building in Sepulpa. This building is currently undergoing its tax credit project. It is one of the buildings in the Sepulpa downtown historic district. Similar to other buildings in the district, in the 1960s the building's facade was covered in decorative metal paneling. At the time that the nomination for the district was written, the building was listed as a non-contributing resource due to the metal panels. In anticipation for the tax credit project, the metal slip cover was removed, revealing the original upper facade. But then the question then became, what happens with the lower facade? During initial conversations, the applicant wanted to revert the building back to the original 1916 condition. However, the lower level of the facade was modified in 1945. Because 1945 is during the period of significance for the historic district, the modern storefront modifications have gained significance and must be retained. We'll also note that those um, modern slip covers that were installed in the 1960s and 70s are becoming historic in their own right. They are acquiring significance and are becoming a very interesting question during, um, during these times. Standard number five, distinctive features, finishes, and construction techniques or examples of craftsmanship that characterize a historic property shall be preserved. These are specific character-finding features of a building that make it singularly unique.
This is the first national bank and trust company building in Oklahoma City. This building is almost done with its tax credit project. It was the it was Oklahoma's largest bank for um, for most of the 20th century. The building was designed by Weary and Alford from Chicago and constructed from 1930 to 1931. The Art Deco style is exemplified by a vertical emphasis. The intricate aluminum decorative elements on the building's interior and exterior are the only examples in Oklahoma City of Art Deco design from this era. The Great Banking Hall is a combination of the classical revival with Art Deco style. making this a singularly impressive space. And loss of any of these distinctive features and finishes would greatly diminish the significance of the building. Standard number six. Deteriorated historic features shall be repaired rather than replaced. Where the severity of deterioration requires replacement of a distinctive feature, the new feature shall match the old in design, color, texture, and other visual qualities and where possible materials. Replacement of missing features shall be substantiated by documentary, physical, or pictorial evidence. Repair and replace. We run into this one a lot with original or historic windows. When a character defining feature like windows, railings, and masonry is deteriorated beyond repair, evidence of the severity of deterioration must be provided as justification for replacement of the feature. Additionally, detailed drawings and product information that compares the original or historic feature with the proposed feature are required to ensure that it matches as close as possible. Deteriorated siding and shingles on this house are being replaced with matching pieces where necessary, while sound elements are being retained. Unfortunately, the congregation of this church replaced the tile roof with asphalt shingles that don't begin to match the quality and appearance of the original roofing material. Standard number six does not forbid the use of substitute materials if they suitably convey the appearance of the historic materials in need of replacement. Rubber tiles or other composite materials can serve as convincing replacements for more expensive slates and other roofing materials. This historic photo shows an eclectic style building circa 1895 as it appeared in the early 20th century. As the building, as the building appeared prior to rehabilitation, the base had been covered to hide the damaged base of the corner turret. When the later siding was removed, the corner was revealed damaged, but still there. Instead of repairing the base of this prominent and character-defining feature, 
the owners chose instead to rebuild it in an entirely different way. And as a result, the building's historic character has been greatly diminished. This does not meet standard six. Standard number seven. Chemical or physical treatments such as sandblasting that cause damage to historic materials shall not be used. The surface cleaning of structures, if appropriate, shall be undertaken using the gentlest means possible, or gentle cleaning. This is to ensure that the material is not damaged and can remain stable and viable for the foreseeable future. Cleaning appropriately can make a great difference in a building's appearance without harming the very materials that make it up. Over the years, this standard has had a tremendously positive effect here. Sandblasting is much less frequent today than it was 20 or 30 years ago. Here's a good indication of damage from sandblasting. In this picture, the building was sandblasted, but the still smooth areas were shielded by a sign and were not accessible to the sandblasters, so there's no damage there. But the brick around the window was not shielded with the effect seen here. So what sandblasting does is that it removes the outer face or skin of the masonry unit, in this case brick, thereby allowing water and air and other weather intrusions into the more um, soft inner core of the brick. Brick and other masonry likes to breathe, but it also likes to be shielded. I kind of equate brick to being like a body or a skin where the exterior face, the finished face of the brick is like skin and the inner core being like muscle. And once you break that skin, it leaves it open to damage the inner core. Standard number eight. Significant archeological resources affected by a project shall be protected and preserved. If such resources must be disturbed, mitigation measures shall be undertaken, or archeology. span This is true for all ground disturbing activities. If archeological resources are found, please contact the Oklahoma Archaeological Survey, as well as our office, the Oklahoma State Historic Preservation Office, for guidance on how to proceed. But work should stop. We have many laws that protect archeological resources. They outlaw looting and pot hunting of public sites, and require that construction projects come to a halt if human remains are discovered so the sites can be properly investigated. Standard number nine, <clears throat> new additions, exterior alterations, or related new construction shall not destroy historic materials that characterize the property. The new work shall be differentiated from the old and shall be compatible with the massing, size, scale, and architectural features to protect the historic integrity of the property and its environment.
along those same lines. Standard number 10 is new additions and adjacent or related new construction shall be undertaken in such a manner that if removed in the future, the essential form and integrity of the historic property and its environment would be unimpaired or new additions. Standards 9 and 10 both deal with new additions and adjacent or related new construction. Together, these standards cover both new additions that are attached to historic buildings and new construction on the historic property surrounding the historic building itself. Standard 9 sets forth the following basic criteria. 1. A new addition should not destroy historic materials or impair character-defining features. 2. A new addition should be differentiated from the historic building and at the same time, the new addition should be compatible with the historic building or compatible differentiation. While standard 10 sets forth what is often called reversibility. In other words, new additions should be attached in such a way that if they are ever removed, the historic building would still be mostly intact. So let's look at some additions. This 19th century house was rehabilitated to serve as a restaurant. And the new wing was added to the front of the house, although set slightly off to the side. This is a problem and does not meet the standards. Is a problem in the fact that it modifies the overall massing and scale of the building and it's on the front of the building instead of on the side or in the back. In this three-story commercial structure, received a rooftop addition that was so duplicative or so much like the original building that, the, that only the date marker distinguishes it from the building beneath. This does not meet the standards. On the other hand, Compare this stair tower This stair tower sticks out like a sore thumb against this building. It is not compatible in terms of material, size, and scale. But on the other hand, when you compare this stair tower at Georgetown University, it is also tucked into a corner between two building masses. Yet it is both compatible with the historic building it serves and is yet clearly differentiated from it. I'm pretty sure this thing has won several awards. This meets the standards. Here's another building that was being rehabilitated. This is the side views of it and was also enlarged with an addition that meets the requirements for compatibility and differentiation. And because it was also attached through openings in the rear wall, it is reversible. Regarding reversibility, this criterion for new additions is a minimum requirement, not a maximum one. In other words, 
new additions should be reversible, but they aren't necessarily approvable just because they are reversible. A new addition must still meet the other standards for rehabilitation. As, a lo as logic might say, reversibility is necessary, but not sufficient. As a final word on new additions, let me just say that standards 9 and 10 do not deal with the style of new additions. New additions can be in any style, from modern to traditional, as long as they meet the tests proposed by the standards themselves, compatibility, differentiation, and reversibility. Thank you, and I will now open it up for questions, comments, and concerns about any of this. We do have one question. All right, so Jeanette, I, I suppose that the same goes for a lodge as it does for churches. The compatible new use should be similar to a meeting or community space and not a mixed use commercial residential. Um, what kind of lodge are we talking about? Like a fraternal lodge or like a hunting lodge? Okay. Um, so, so for old Masonic lodges or, you know, IOF from all those other fraternal lodges, um, yes and no, it kind of depends on which spaces we're talking about. Um, if we're talking about, you know, the the grand meeting space, then those tend to be, um, we'll want to see them be kept um, in their historic volume. Um, but there are instances where um, I've seen them be subdivided. It just depends on how significant they are to the building and if they're you know, high style or, you know, um, if there's any other character defining features within the space. I have also seen them if they're not so big, um, like the spaces themselves are, um, are such that um, I have seen it where one unit will be installed in that one space. So, you know, sometimes those will be on the upper level of a building and, you know, one half will be um, the Masons, the other half will be Eastern Star. Um, and so each of those, you know, divided spaces will be singular units um, with the other like support spaces being utilized for other purposes, whether that be integrated into those spaces as like closets or bathrooms. Um, but it just, again, it depends on, it depends on the building. But that's generally how we look at um, lodge spaces. So, any other questions? Now, if the whole building is a lodge, then there may be some wiggle room. There may be some other spaces that can be utilized and that, that can be used as, and then the, the meeting spaces be used as community spaces. Um, I guess those platforms, so.
Yeah, so that's one of those that I would probably look at doing more of, um, you know, open spaces versus just residential. Um, residential may not be the best option for that particular building if it's all um, Masonic and both spaces are utilized for those purposes. So you're welcome. Not saying it can't be done. It's just going to be one of those we have to look at it, you know, specifically. So, any other questions? And they can be specific to your buildings if you have them. Um, I will say that these are because I know I have a few um, consultants here. Um, the standards are also what I use for evaluating um, effects of projects on historic properties through the one through the Section 106 program. So. Okay. Yeah, just email me your questions if you don't want to ask them here. It's more than fair. Be more than happy to answer them. Any other questions, comments, or concerns about any of this? Okay, seeing none, I will get out of here early again. Um, so tomorrow is going to be on the guidelines, which again are, um, you know, advisory, not not regulatory, um, but it is kind of, it does provide guidance on what to think about and how to do, um, you know, kind of how to do some of this, some of these work you know, things to think about when you're looking at windows, when you're looking at masonry, when you're looking at um, walls. So I hope you join me again tomorrow for that conversation. And with that, we'll just I also have um, Oh, before we leave, I also have handouts under the handouts tab. Um, for you to have. A couple of them are our fact sheets, which are kind of, you know, snapshots of the tax incentives program. Um, checklists for if you're actually going through the application process, just to make sure you have everything. And then the instruction booklets and applications that are fillable PDFs um, for actually submitting projects to our office. All right, with that, I will give you all a couple minutes to get those handouts, but then, yeah, that should be it. We'll see you all tomorrow. Have a great day.